So my name is Pete Flint, um, and today I'm going to talk about the rise of fintech-enabled marketplaces uh, and why we think these present some of the, the massive opportunities or next wave of opportunities in marketplaces. Uh, just to give a little bit of, of my background, so uh, really my background in three chapters. Um, started, uh, was, was born in the UK, was part of the founding team of LastMinute.com, which became Europe's largest online travel marketplace. Interesting fact, they went public within 18 months of launch. 18 months of launch, you can hardly imagine that happens today. Um, then I moved to the US and founded Trulia, the online real estate marketplace, and then merged that with Zillow to build the world's largest real estate marketplace. Uh, and now uh, a general partner at NFX. What we do is we essentially lead seed deals in network effect businesses. A big component of that is marketplaces, obviously. My partner, James, is running around, and our goal is really to take companies from idea to IPO. So we think it's, it's uh, and, and Roger was talking about this morning, why it's super early days in market, marketplace development. And I think there's a perception that some of the large categories are already picked off. Okay, there's transportation, there's real estate, there's hospitality, but we still think we're very, very early days. And if you look at the, the, the online penetration, Within these marketplaces, it's still in the single digits or low double digits. Very, very early penetration numbers, and that will con continue to grow. We see that going to over 50% over the next several years. As more digital millennials, uh, digital natives come online and transition their spending online. It's very, very early days in market development, marketplace development. And we broadly see two uh, two major opportunities for new startups within this, within this category. So one is disrupting existing marketplaces. Uh, uh, so that's where typically a company will find an underserved niche and go after that underserved niche and, and, and hope and, and intend that underserved niche to expand to a bigger piece of the market. Accelerate the transition from offline to online. That typically involves deep vertical integration. And then, and then built on top of that is a breakthrough product experience. The other opportunity is, is greenfield opportunities, so service marketplaces, regulated industries, B2B marketplaces. But we think uh, that the biggest opportunities uh, within, within both these areas is what we call fintech-enabled marketplaces, and we'll talk about what that is. So fundamentally, we see fintech-enabled marketplaces as where you deeply embed a financial services component into a marketplace experience to create a breakthrough product experience that unlocks huge amounts of value. And I think we've seen how the internet has done an incredible job of transforming the way that you discover, you communicate and pay for goods and services. But we're starting to see now a radical shift in the way that the value is exchanged between participants in that ecosystem. So to give us a sense of kind of where we're going, let's, let's take a moment to look at the past and the history. So within marketplaces, there has been this relentless increase in both improving the experience, both on the supply side and the demand side, as well as value capture within the transaction. And typically, companies will enter a marketplace either in one of these two areas, typically on the experience side. So they'll either verticalize or they'll mobilize or they'll build some sort of new, new product experience, such they improve the product experience and then over time capture more value as they get liquidity. And what happens with these, with these businesses is either you create a new marketplace business that uh, coexists with an existing marketplace, so Craigslist didn't die, it was just kind of picked apart by various different companies, or you end up radically breaking the original, um, the original marketplace business. So let's take a look at a few different categories. So we've seen how the hospitality industry has evolved in the last 20 years. Craigslist, HomeAway, which is really a lead gen businesses, to a transactional marketplace, through to a kind of tightly managed marketplace such as Lyric and Zeus and a number of other companies that are providing tightly managed services. So this is a $170 billion business, $500 million in, in gross rental, it's incredibly early days in, in these businesses, and all these businesses generally are just doing fine. 
The next area is food delivery. So we've seen, a, again, this evolution from a horizontal, horizontal lead generation to vertical focus to end-to-end -end marketplace. Again, improving the user experience. New companies have entered this market with a breakthrough product experience, capturing more value within the transaction. And then real estate the industry that, that I was focused on before this has had the same arc. Companies are improving the user experience stage over stage and capturing more value. And so you've seen companies uh, such as Opendoor over the last, last couple of years that is capturing a significant amount of the transaction. They often say that they're approaching sort of seven, eight, nine percent of, of the transactional value. Whereas when I was at Truly and Zillow, we would be just incredibly delighted to get anywhere close to that number. And of course, Opendoor has raised something like a billion dollars of debt to facilitate these transactions. So it's fundamentally at the back end, it's a, it's a financial services company, but, but it's absolutely building a marketplace on top of that. So you really don't need to go very far to figure out opportunities to capture more value and to improve the Unix user experience than, than to look at the financial services industry. So staggeringly, 21% of the 100 largest companies in the US are financial services firms. So these are banks, these are insurance companies, these are lending companies, these are payment networks. 21% of the largest companies by revenue are financial services firms. And no surprise, they deliver just a incredible, incredibly bad user experience. So, so the sort of traditional, in a bunch of major traditional financial services firms, the NPS scores are negative. You know, we all know that. Um, and of course, uh, you know, modern digital software companies uh, have, you know, really exceptional NPS scores. And at the heart of the opportunity, the problem here is misaligned incentives and a high friction experience. So let's just take the, the situation where I'm, uh, I want to buy a car and trade in my old car. Um, so as a, as a potential car buyer, I obviously want to pay the lowest price for that product. The dealer wants to charge me the highest price for that product. Okay, I get that. And then I want to trade in my car, and the, the guy who's doing the trading desk wants to uh, buy my car at the lowest, price, lowest possible price. And then the lending, lending division in the dealership wants to charge me the, uh, the highest rate that he can get away with and probably get me in the most debt. And then I need to figure out insurance, and then I need to figure out registration. Um, the whole kind of process is incredibly high friction, and, and at all the participants there have very often very misaligned incentives. So that's the heart of the problem and the opportunity within these big categories. And there are tons of opportunities where this happens. So folks may have seen this chart. It's a quite a famous chart that's circulated. So the red is the, uh, the, the lines here are basically pr average prices over the last 20 years for a whole range of different consumer goods. And the red are those that have incre prices have increased higher than inflation, and the blue are those that have, have uh, decreased uh, compared to inflation. And there are tons of industries that are either um, high friction, misaligned incented, regulated industries, uh, industries that we think over time will start to buckle. These curves will start to buckle, and we see they're ripe for opportunity, probably not on a macro basis, but there are wedges and fissures and opportunities within segments that companies can build interesting businesses and grow out from there. And of course, what I'm talking about is not radically new. Uh, so you go back into Airbnb. In 2012, they uh, announced, after kind of some embarrassing, uh, some embarrassing incidents, a $1 million guarantee for home sellers, enabling them to scale their supply side significantly. And just on Monday, you've seen, it's, while not it's a sort of perfect example of a marketplace, it's certainly a two-sided platform with iOS of payment company or a, a platform adding a payment and then adding credit facility on top of that. It's absolutely this progression. So Apple is absolutely focused on 
How do I improve the experience? How do I capture more value of the, from, from the participants in the, in the platform? So we've identified four key catalysts for fintech-enabled marketplaces. So one, kind of obviously, is the changing consumer demand. So consumers just, they crave uh, a better consumer experience, and that's happening relentlessly. <clears throat> Two is the money is already flowing through these marketplaces. So this is the next evolution of that. And so there's not just payments, but how do you more sophisticated, how do you improve the experience in a better way? Three is superior underwriting from uh, machine learning and new data collection. And four is the enabling technologies and capital. So you've seen how fintech companies such as Stripe and the capital that is, is in, in coming into the industry is enabling these new platforms and opportunities. So next, I'm going to talk through five advantages of fintech-enabled marketplaces. So the first is capturing demand side by removing friction. So companies are able to make this breakthrough experience um, by, by embedding fintech services into their product, and that captures way more demand than they were previously able to do. So take FAIR, F-A-I-R dot com. So this is a company that kind of solves that dealership problem I talked about before. So you're able to, uh, it's a rental company. So to the consumer, it's able, are able to rent a car and trade in after a period of time to kind of constantly change how I think about car ownership. On the back end, it's an auto leasing company. So they've raised hundreds of millions of dollars of debt and equity to facilitate this platform, trying to reinvent the way that you think about auto ownership. Uh, another company, the NFX investing company called Ribbon, helping you to buy your next home before you sold your previous home. Massive amounts of friction for the prospective uh, home buyer. And they've raised hundreds of millions of dollars of debt to provide the service to, to prospective home buyers. Uh, and they charge a small service fee for this, which is often less than the price you get for an uh, all, tra all cash transaction. And it, and it enables you to work with your existing agent. So certainly removing friction increases demand. Next is unlocking latent supply. So using insurance, insurance components, data models, or lending facilities. So we already talked about Airbnb. The, the, the guarantees, the, the insurance policy essentially, unlock massive amount of supply for these marketplaces. Next is, is Lyft. If any folks have read through Lyft's S1, they'll know they have a significant owned and operated insurance entity within that company. And third is a company, FAIR, not to be, not to be confused with the auto company, F-A-I-R, sorry, F-A-I-R-E dot com. Um, and what this company does, it it's the observation is that for small and medium-sized retailers, they are, they're risk averse to, to bring on new inventory and new product into their stores. So FAIR provides uh, uh, risk-free return or free returns and, uh, and, and, and cheaper uh, and favorable payment terms such that they're able to easily uh, distribute those products to these small and medium-sized retailers. Uh, and so they're centralizing the risk and capturing huge amounts of data to provide services that company is, is doing very well. So the third area is reducing multi-tenanting by expanding relationship, both on the dis de demand side and also on the supply side. And th this is really being fueled by data. So this is being fueled by data. So you're seeing locking in the, the demand and supply side. So take Uber. Uber also has a credit card, expanding from payments, but they're very sophisticated about their payment infrastructure. And obviously in Uber and Lyft, massive multi-tenanting problem. So deeply integrate payments, locking in the supply, certainly on this case, the supply side. And you've seen Square evolve dramatically. What started as uh, perceived to be a low margin payment network has expanded into a uh, Square Capital, a lending facility, obviously Square Cash, which has appeared to be a payments platform, much higher margin businesses, deeper network effects. 
And then fourth, misaligned incentives. We talked about this, um, a huge opportunity to unlock value where there's misaligned incentives. And we think there's intriguing opportunities within the healthcare space. Health insurance, as we all know, is, is an area with massive misaligned incentives, but very tricky to navigate. So Lambda score is probably the kind of most recent classic example. So on the outside, this looks like a school. On the inside, it looks like a student loan company. And the alignment between, you know, in a professional school, uh, the, the classes, they are directly incented uh, uh, to, to ensure that the classes are highly performing and students get, um, and students get jobs at the end of it because the only way they make money is by um, charging you a, a fee for the next two years or percentage of your income for the next two years. And then finally, subsidized product and marketing through bundling. So <clears throat> this is really capturing more of the economics and then using that to subsidize either the product or the marketing. So it makes unprofitable acquisition channels profitable by bundling products together. Or also can mean that you capture more margin. That means you can subsidize the user experience, more hand-holding, concierge services, that kind of thing. Uh, so Zillow is rapidly vertically integrating. So they have their own mortgage company within the organization, capturing more of the revenue. And that enables them essentially to subsidize the product, which is buying homes in, in the form of Zillow offers. And then Sonda, which is a uh, home stay company, a sort of living as a service company, is again, is, cap is providing a whole suite of services, capturing the, more, capturing the value and monetizing them. So a lot of this is, is obviously possible um, through the platforms that enable this. And we think as, as kind of investors, we look at not only the marketplace opportunity, but also the platform opportunity. What are the companies that are enabling this? And there are emerging companies in a whole range of different areas. Obviously, payments, banking, the ISA, the income share agreements, insurance, security, and many others. And again, if we, if we have this thesis, or we have this belief that this area is just growing and, and growing dramatically, then we think there's going to be a huge amount of opportunity in platform businesses that enable this underlying evolution as we embed financial services deeper and in, in a more complex way into these marketplace businesses. And so ultimately, I guess I, I like to say the money is in the money. <laughs> and, um, and we've seen as this kind of in, inherent rise towards a better consumer experience, uh, capturing more value of the transaction, we will transition into an area where we see fintech-enabled marketplaces will unlock a huge amount of value and create a whole set of multi-billion dollar businesses. So I'll end there and, um, and open it up for any questions that, that folks have. Hi. So I have a question. Uh, so uh, you talked about Chase and a lot of the other companies have a you know, not so good customer experience, right? But they're hugely profitable and long running companies. What do you think uh, the FinTech enabled marketplaces will need to kind of like overcome? Um, you know, you know, because I, and I guess what's for my question is, a lot of the fintech enabled places, they may not be profitable, right? They might have huge valuation, they're not quite profitable, you know, unlike the chase of the world. What do you think some of the hurdles that they need to overcome in order to be like a real relevant player, you know, not just in the lending world, but in the real economy, you know, necessary? Well, I think, I guess from a startup perspective, I think the, what we've seen in these companies is a, is a, certainly from a startup point of view, is a, ton of complexity early on. So you typically have to have a DNA, which is both understand marketplace dynamics and how to build exceptional products with a high degree of financial sophistication and doing this probably in a mature market. So this is generally just really hard for anyone. So the DNA of the team and certainly the founders has to be, um, has to be something very, very special and them to kind of understand and navigate this execution because, you know, the companies that are able to raise hundreds of millions of dollars of debt um, are those that have very kind of typically very experienced CEOs that are able to navigate and deep domain expertise in the category. Um, 
And so you have to be able to let, okay, how do I, how do I capture demand, demand and supply? How do I work with banks and lending facilities and quite, you know, manage the risk profile of that? Um, and then also, uh, you know, these are typically often mature industries or regulated industries, and that requires a, a special set of, of experience. You know, I think what we talked about here is not, um, you know, this is not about creating a new bank. You know, that's, that's what I would say is purely a fintech type business. But I think the, our orientation is really looking at it from the, de the demand problem or the supply problem, and how can you reinvent that experience? And consistently you've seen how companies that have either captured more value or built a breakthrough experience have created this real magic. And you see, you know, I think out of those companies we talked about, they've all created that kind of breakthrough experience that enables them to create a wedge into the market and then expand from there into, into a bigger opportunity. Yeah. Well, I think, there's, I think there's kind of two evolutions for, or two paths. You, you, you either, so let's take um, uh, Open Door or Square, for instance. So they started really as a more of a fintech type company. You know, certainly Open Door raised huge amounts of, of debt and equity, enabling them to flip homes. The payment networks are starting very much from the fin, fin side of things, or the financial services side of things. And then you see in other companies that approach it purely from a marketplace perspective, they're adding in, you know, the payment platform is there and they're just doing smarter stuff to improve on, on that experience. Those are, those are kind of probably the incremental evolution into, the, into this area and, and both are opportunities. And so if you're able to start to get a high volume of payments into a complex and, and perhaps asset heavy category, then you can start to do very interesting things on financing. I, I do generally think, though, that there are the, that's kind of like incremental evolution. I do think there's probably a bunch of breakthrough ideas in these, in these categories which will um, create transformative impact. And that's, you know, I don't know, I don't think we know exactly what that looks like, but the, I look at those charts or the, the lines in red, they absolutely present enormous opportunity for companies. And my, my sense is that a lot of them will be unlocked by some sort of financing component. Like how can, you, how can you add in a finance component that either manages the risk more effectively or manages the asset and financing more effective? And you know, I think um, we're looking for founders that have those breakthrough ideas and, and we'll kind of, probably everyone else is as well. Um, we're, we're certainly looking for those founders that have those break, breakthrough ideas that we can help to fund and support those companies. I was, we're certainly seeing, I think you're seeing a lot of, you know, for asset heavy industries, whether that's industrial equipment or whether that's, um, you know, large trucks, for instance, or whether that's homes, you know, live, living as a service is kind of a, a you know, a more of a common phrase um, in, in, uh, in the sort of residential space. And so we're seeing this, you know, this asset light. Um, it's certainly an experience that consumers, younger consumers crave, and there's obviously a ton of benefits for that so you know I think and I think there are when you look at particularly on the B2B side I think there are a ton of opportunities there that there are you know there are already existing financial leasing companies built out there but they're generally you know their their data um, their data assets and their, their understanding of data is quite limited you know and that's you've seen that opportunity insurance where insurance companies are built modern insurance companies have a better underwriting model because they're collecting more data and are doing and, and are better kind of models from, from technology that is available today as opposed to when they're invented 20, 30, or 40 years ago. And the same thing is probably on the B2B side. There's a ton of financing models that I think are, are very unsophisticated 
and there are companies that will crop up to, to capture that opportunity. All right. Thanks, everyone. Good to see you.